and John Ralston Saul, he's an ethicist and novelist. He will be introducing John Ralston Saul. Thank you so much. Please welcome, please welcome <laughs> to John. I'm using this one? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my uh, only job is to get off this stage as fast as possible so that uh, Professor Monk can talk to you about Wittgenstein and uh, I would just be getting in the way. Um, it is, the basics are very simple. Uh, professor Monk is a professor of philosophy at the University of Southampton. Um, his most recent book is a biography of Robert Oppenheimer one of the most interesting figures I think one could say in terms of ethics, morality, science, where we're going, where we shouldn't be going. And so I think it's, fa it's fascinating that you've chosen that as, a f as the next biography. Um, he's famous for two biographies in particular, the, the most recent one being two volumes on Bertrand Russell, and of course, before that, 1990, his biography of Wittgenstein, which won all sorts of prizes. Uh, He'll talk about it, I'm sure, but Wittgenstein and Russell are uh, Siamese twins of two different generations, I suppose. And um, I think that what is fascinating to me, and I'm, I'm, I hope, since I know you don't have a prepared speech, I hope you'll address it, is the relationship between the two and whether when you look back on it now, wh who's the genius? Uh, we know who the great public figure was, but who is the great genius in terms of philosophy. We owe Professor Monk a great deal because if Wittgenstein is the great Western philosopher of the 20th century, if he is, then somebody has to explain it. Uh, because every time I think I've understood it a week later, I've forgotten what I understood. And I think this is a man who, through this biography, has found a way to uh, help us understand Wittgenstein through his life through everything around him, through his personality, a way into philosophy, which is uh, a difficult philosophy. So we're very grateful to him for that. Uh, Professor Monk. Well, thank you very much. And um, thank you all for, for coming. It's, um, it's a great honor to be here and to be speaking to so many people. Um, let me begin by saying something about the origin of my biography of, of Wittgenstein. My, my background is, is, is not in literature or biography, it's in the f philosophy of mathematics and logic. And I, I, I was working on Wittgenstein's philosophy of mathematics, and it seemed to me that in the prevalent literature it was being misunderstood in a particular kind of way. And the way that it was misunderstood, I'd like to describe by saying that the spirit in which Wittgenstein wrote was misunderstood. And I thought that one way of getting across the spirit in which he wrote would be to try and convey what kind of person he was, and therefore why, what he wanted from philosophy. At the time that I wrote my biography, there was a great deal of interest in Wittgenstein, but it, 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 it came in two very distinct parts. On the one hand, there was his enormous influence on academic philosophy. There wasn't a course in philosophy anywhere in the world, uh, an undergraduate course that didn't have some uh, content on, on Wittgenstein. His, his influence on academic philosophy was enormous. But also, there was quite separately from that, there was a literature about him himself, about, you know, every, you know, about what an extraordinary person he was, how intense he was, how charismatic he was, how interested he was in spiritual concerns and ethical concerns. And what I wanted to do was try and show the connection between these two things, to try and show that this person about whom Derek Jarman was inspired to make a movie, uh, who had inspired all sorts of uh, poems and novels, that this man with all his intensity and his spiritual preoccupations was the same person who wrote on logic and the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of language. And more than that, I wanted to show how his ethical and spiritual uh, interests fed into his philosophy so that it, it seemed to me that once you understood that, then you could, so to speak, have, uh, read, read his work in the spirit in which 
it was, it, it was written. Uh, so it, it, it seems to me one thing that a biography can do with regard to a philosopher, of course a, biographer, a biography can tell you all sorts of facts about the philosopher, but also I think, like with, with understanding each other, it's important to understand not just what we're saying, but for example, the tone of voice that we're speaking in. So if you, if you understand the words that somebody says, but you don't catch that they're being sarcastic, or you don't catch that there's fear in their voice, or there's triumph in their voice, then there's something that you've misunderstood. And so part of understanding each other is understanding, so to speak, the tone of voice. And I think that is what a biography can do for Wittgenstein. It can uh, uh, help you understand what tone of voice he's writing in, and therefore the spirit in which he's writing. Okay, with regard to Wittgenstein and, and Russell, I think there is an instructive... They, they, they both work together, and I'll say more about that later on. But there's an instructive difference, I think, between the two with regard to why they went into philosophy in the first place. Russell often says that the great moment of his childhood was when his brother taught him Euclidean geometry. Now, most of us, he said, it was, he, he said the experience of learning geometry was as dazzling as first love. And, and that's not most of our experience of learning geometry, I don't, don't think. Um, why was it Russell's experience? Well, because finally, and this was at the age of 11, he came across something that he could know and know with absolute certainty. If you accept the premises, then you have to accept the theorems. If you accept the axioms, you have to accept the theorems. If you accept the premises, you have to accept the conclusions. And that's what he found so delightful, because his world up until then, Russell's world up until then, had been fraught with uncertainties. His parents died when he was very little, and then he was brought up by his grandparents, and then his grandfather died, and he was brought up by his grandmother alone. But also his grandmother thought that his parents had been very wicked, and so spoke very little about them. And so the young Bertie Russell was brought up, knowing almost nothing about his parents, and with a vague sense that they'd done something wrong, and this constant sense of uncertainty. So for Russell, certainty was as dazzling as first love. And he said, you know, that he delighted in the idea that if you accepted the axioms of Euclidean geometry, you had to accept the theorems. It didn't matter who said it. It didn't matter what mood you were in. Nothing else mattered. The, 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 the truth of the theorems followed with absolute certainty from the truth of the axioms. And then his whole philosophy of mathematics is based on trying to give the same kind of certainty to the axioms themselves. So why does Russell get into philosophy because he's looking for certainty. He's looking for certain knowledge. Wittgenstein went into philosophy for a completely different reason. He wasn't looking for certain knowledge. He was looking for clarity. Wittgenstein went into philosophy because he felt confused, not because he felt uncertain. There's a, the, the first moment that Wittgenstein can remember of thinking philosophically is he remembers stopping halfway through a door because a question had occurred to him. The question was, if it's to our advantage to lie, why should we tell the truth? And so he was very struck by that question, very, very struck by what kind of question it was and wanted to answer it. Okay, so... Wittgenstein's all, if Russell's philosophy is all about laying foundations for certain knowledge, Wittgenstein's philosophy is all about getting rid of confusion, getting clarity where previously things were in a midst. Okay, I called my book The Duty of Genius because I wanted, the, there's a phrase from a book by Otto Weininger that logic and ethics are two sides of the same thing. He says they are no more than two aspects of the duty we owe to ourselves, logic and ethics. And it seemed to me that that remark beautifully sums up what I was trying to show about Wittgenstein, that his concern for clarity, his concern with logic, and his concern with decency, his concern with ethics, were two sides of the same person and two sides, as it were, of the same, of the same task. Um, so 
I called my book The, 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 the Duty of Genius. The, this is the, 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 the key that holds the whole thing together. The, the idea that uh, striving after clear thinking and striving after being a decent person are for Wittgenstein two sides of the same, of the same task. All right, let me say a bit about Wittgenstein himself. He was born into a fabulously wealthy family. The Wittgensteins owned the iron and steel industry in the Habsburg Empire. He was born in Vienna. Uh, he was from a very large family. And his, his father was immensely wealthy. They owned very many houses, including the Palais Wittgenstein in Vienna itself, which had you know, a glorious uh, music room, a very uh, e elaborate and opulent uh, staircase. And it was not only gorgeous and opulent, it was also the center, or one of the centers of Viennese cultural life, a particularly interesting point in Viennese cultural history. This is, that's to say, the turn of the, uh, the, the, turn of the 20th century. Wittgenstein was born in, in, in 1889 at a time when Vienna was the center of a whole bunch of interesting intellectual, cultural, and artistic movements. It was in Vienna that Freud developed psychoanalysis, that Gustav Klimt and Oskar Kokoschka started the Jugendstil movement in, in art, and, uh, and Wittgenstein's father paid for the secession building in which they exhibited their, 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 their new works of art. It was in Vienna that Adolf Loos um, instituted a new way of building, a new kind of architecture that did away with ornamentation. But above all, it was music that was the art form that the Wittgensteins were most interested in. Wittgenstein himself had a, had a, had a very precise ear for, 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 for music. The house was the center of the musical scene in Vienna. Uh, Brahms came to the house many times and Several of Brahms's, uh, particularly his, his chamber works, received their first performances at the home of the Wittgensteins. So the, the musicality that Wittgenstein grew up with was of an extraordinarily high standard. So it's a very wealthy family. It's artistically a very refined uh, and sophisticated family. But also it was a family marked by tragedy. Uh, Wittgenstein had four brothers three of them committed suicide. The first brother to commit suicide was his brother Hans, who was a musical prodigy. Hans was like Mozart. He was playing the piano while still an infant. He was uh, 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 composing orchestral music by the time he was five years old. And music was the only thing that Hans was interested in. But their father, Karl Wittgenstein, insisted that Hans Wittgenstein, who was the oldest of, of, of the family, the oldest of, the, of Wittgenstein's siblings, he insisted that Hans take over the iron and steel Carl Wittgenstein uh, uh, had built up. And in order to escape that and pursue his dream of being a musician, Hans Wittgenstein fled to the United States of America, where his body was found in Chesapeake Bay. He, 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 he drowned himself. The second brother to commit suicide was Rudolf, and there's a similar story. Rudolf was not a musician, but he was very interested in becoming an actor. His great love was the drama. Uh, and he was a gay man at a time when it was positively dangerous to be a gay man. And Rudolf committed suicide in a very spectacular, theatrical kind of way. He went to Berlin, went to a bar. He ordered two drinks, sat down. He asked the piano player to play a, a love song. Uh, and, then he, uh, 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 and then he shot himself in, in, in this bar. Then the third brother to commit suicide was Kurt in a very different kind of way. Kurt committed suicide much later during the First World War when the troops under his command refused to obey his command and he thought the only honorable thing to do was to kill himself. Okay, so Ludwig Wittgenstein is the youngest of this brood. He's got three sisters, Hermina, uh, Hermina uh, uh, Gretel, and, and Helena, uh, and uh, and, 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 and four brothers, three of whom committed suicide. Wittgenstein was actually, although he's now regarded as one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived and certainly the greatest philosopher of the 20th century, was in his family regarded as rather a dull boy. He wasn't regarded as, as, as special at all. He had no outstanding musical gifts. He wasn't a particularly uh, great writer and so on. What he was interested in, though, was engineering, much to the delight of his father. And he studied engineering in Vienna 
and then in Berlin, and then came to Manchester. Now, at Manchester, he started attending lectures in mathematics. And I said before that Wittgenstein became a philosopher because he wanted clarity. Well, in Manchester, Wittgenstein's particular kind of en engineering was aeronautical engineering. He was designing a jet engine uh, in the very early days, this is 1908, 1909, very early days of aeronautical engineering. And Wittgenstein was pioneering the design of a jet engine. And he got particularly interested in the design of the propellers, which turned out to be a mathematical task. And he then got interested in mathematics and started attending mathematics classes, and then got interested in the question, what is mathematics? Curiously, that development of you know, being interested in practical things, and then physics, and then mathematics, and then ultimately philosophy, is paralleled uh, by the character in, in a Viennese novel, The Man Without Qualities, uh, by Thomas Musil. Um, it, it, the, the central character in that book goes through exactly that uh, uh, trajectory. OK, so by 1910, Wittgenstein, in Manchester, had lost interest in his aeronautical studies and become fixated with the question, the philosophical question, what is mathematics? And the, more or less the only thing he could find to read on that question was a book that Bertrand Russell had published in 1903 called The Principles of Mathematics. So Wittgenstein read this book, and in this book, Russell frankly admits that he has a theory about uh, mathematics, but the theory has encountered a problem. The theory is that all numbers are really classes. And the problem was that the notion of a class, as Russell developed it, was contradictory. So there was a contradiction built right into the heart of his theory of logic. Wittgenstein set as his task solving that contradiction. And that tied in with a general ethical... I, I said at the beginning that my, my, the title for my book, The Duty of Genius, comes from this book by Otto Weininger, which Wittgenstein read when he was a teenager, before he went to Manchester. Otto Weininger wrote this book, Sex and Character. And frankly, it's a completely mad book. The, 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 the view that it develops is that men and women are completely different in this sense, that women cannot, don't, don't think in concepts, they think in pre-concepts whereas men think in concepts. The other aspect of that theory is that Jews and homosexuals are a kind of woman. All Jews, according to Otto Weininger, are female, and so are all homosexuals. And only men, according to Weininger, can develop into real human beings, geniuses. Because the final duty of every man is to realize the duty in themselves. So when I read this book, I thought, what on earth? Wittgenstein used to cite this book as having had a big influence on him. And I thought, how on earth could this crazy book have any influence on such a great philosopher as Wittgenstein? And it seems to me that it wasn't the stuff about Jews, and it wasn't the stuff about homosexuals, and it wasn't the stuff about women. What influenced Wittgenstein was the idea that the single task that all of us face is the task to realize the genius within us. Okay, so fast forward now to 1910. Wittgenstein's in Manchester. He's learning engineering, but he's becoming increasingly obsessed with the philosophy of mathematics, and particularly Russell's problem of what to do about the contradiction that he's discovered. And it seems to me that Wittgenstein threw himself into that because he realized that that's where his genius lay. He had adopted this idea of Weininger's that the really important task is to find our genius and to develop it. And he thought he'd found it in this problem, the problem of what to do about Russell's theory of mathematics. OK, so being Wittgenstein, he doesn't fill in forms and apply to go to Cambridge. Russell was at that time teaching at the University of Cambridge. Wittgenstein didn't bother filling in any forms or applying to, to, to work with Russell or any of that stuff. He just went down to Cambridge, and he went to Trinity College, where, where, where Bertrand Russell was, and suddenly appeared at Bertrand Russell's lectures. He wasn't officially a student or anything. He just suddenly appeared at the lectures. 
Rus Rus Russell was delighted by this because he had very few takers for his lectures because they were very difficult. Um, and he writes to his lover, Ottilie, and he says, oh, I've, you know, I've, I've just got this new German. He, he didn't know that he was Austrian. Just got this new German arrived. But then he wrote another letter saying, my new German threatens to be a bit of a pest. Because what, what Wittgenstein did was, after Russell had lectured, Wittgenstein would then follow him into his rooms at Trinity College, Cambridge. While Russell was getting ready for dinner, Wittgenstein would be still there arguing about logic. And... Uh, 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 Russell was unsure whether he was a particularly gifted, brilliant student or whether he was just a lunatic. And uh, at the end of that term, so this is the, the autumn term of 1911, Wittgenstein came to Russell and said, I want to know whether I have any genuine talent for philosophy. Because if I haven't, I'll go back to Manchester and study engineering. And Russell said, well, you, you'll have to write something. And so Wittgenstein wrote something, returned in January uh, 1912 with this, with this thing, and Russell, which hasn't survived, it's one of my great frustrations that that hasn't survived, but Russell said that he read it, and after the very first sentence, he said to Wittgenstein, no, you mustn't return uh, to, to Manchester, you must stay here and pursue philosophy. And that's what Wittgenstein did. From 1912 onwards, he was working full-time on philosophy. I think it says a lot about both Russell and Cambridge that they were prepared to take Wittgenstein on at that time in that way. I don't think there is any other university in the world that would have admitted Wittgenstein as a research student just because he'd written something that impressed Russell. Um, it wouldn't have happened at Oxford, it wouldn't have happened in Vienna, it wouldn't have happened in Paris. I don't believe it would have happened anywhere else. Uh, Cambridge University showed remarkable flexibility here and, uh, 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 and Russell showed the uh, confidence in his own judgment. Because after all, Wittgenstein hadn't studied any philosophy apart, apart from Russell's work. He hadn't done any courses in philosophy. He didn't know anything about Plato or Aristotle or all the classic philosophers. He, what he did was he'd read Russell and he'd become obsessed with Russell's problem. And by the summer of 1912, when Vic, one of Wittgenstein's sisters, Hermina, visited Cambridge, Russell said to Hermina, we expect the next big step in philosophy to be taken by your, your, your brother, Ludwig, which is absolutely remarkable. He'd been at Cambridge for less than a year. He had no formal education in philosophy. And here was the most renowned, one of the most renowned philosophers in the world saying the next big step in philosophy will be taken by Wittgenstein. Okay, so what was that step? Well, the problem that Russell had got was this. His philosophy of mathematics said mathematics is really logic. But when he encountered this contradiction, he came to think he hadn't understood what logic was. So the problem that Wittgenstein inherited and that Russell thought would be the next big step in philosophy is the question, what is logic? And Wittgenstein, in order to think about this, characteristically took an extreme step. He, he decided to leave Cambridge and go to Norway and have a house built specially for him on the side of a Norwegian field where he could be completely alone. Russell, in his autobiography, says that Wittgenstein, when Wittgenstein described this plan to him, he thought that it was mad and tried to talk uh, Wittgenstein out of it. He said it would, be, it, it, it would be dark half the year, and Wittgenstein said he didn't mind. Uh, and, and, Wittgenstein, and Russell said, yes, but you'll be lonely. And, and, and Wittgenstein said, you know, I'm happy being on my own. And finally, um, Russell said, it will drive you nuts. And uh, Wittgenstein said... God preserve me from sanity. And Russell added, God certainly will. <laughs> so in this hut in Norway, 1913 to 1914, Wittgenstein had what he always later described as his most fertile philosophical period. And he developed all the work that was then embodied in the, the, the uh, work that he published after the First World War, to which he gave the, the, the Latin title Tractatus Logico Philosophicus which means a logico-philosophical tract. It's a, tr a philosophical tract about the nature of logic. And all the ideas, the, the ideas about the nature of logic were developed in this hut in Norway. Central to those ideas was the distinction between what we can say and what has to be shown. So Wittgenstein says, 
logic is all to do with language. There is not, as Russell had thought, a separate study of logical uh, relations, logical form. To understand logic, according to Wittgenstein, you need to understand the nature of language, and that means understanding the limitations of language. It means understanding what cannot be said. And in particular, according to Wittgenstein, where Russell went wrong was trying to articulate the nature of logic. L the nature of logic, according to Wittgenstein, is one of those things that cannot be said. Because it's a bit like trying to jump on top of your own shadow. You know, if you see your shadow and you try to jump on it, you're never going to do it. Because every time you jump, your shadow moves with you. Well, likewise, according to Wittgenstein, you can't use language to describe the nature of logic because everything you say in logic, uh, in language, assumes the nature of logic. So you're always going to carry that assumption with you. So he distinguished what one can say with what one can show with regard to logic. Okay, and he'd almost finished that work, which would have been a very different work had he not fought in the First World War. But what happened was, in the summer of 1914, he went back to Vienna, and during that summer, the First World War broke out, and Wittgenstein decided to enlist in the Austrian army. Russell, meanwhile, of course, was campaigning against the war on pacifist principles. But Wittgenstein enlisted in the army largely because he wanted the experience of facing death. And the reason he wanted that experience is that he'd been reading William James's book, Varieties of Religious Experience. Now, Wittgenstein was not a religious man at this point. He was an atheist. But he had a great respect for religious experience and a, a, a religious outlook. Not religious belief. He had virtually no respect for, you know, believing in the virgin birth or believing in the last judgment. He had no respect for religious beliefs, but he had respect for the kind of seriousness, the utter seriousness that comes with being religious. And this is what he read about in Varieties of Religious Experience. And in that book, James interviews people who've gone through a religious experience. And one of the things that's fairly common to those people is the experience of facing death. Because in that experience, you know, all the trivialities of life are, as it were, eliminated and you're face to face with, you know, what is really serious. And because of reading that book, Wittgenstein wanted the experience of facing death. And so he enlisted in the Austrian army and left his, you know, uh, thought that he would finish his book uh, 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 you know, while he was fighting, bizarrely. Well, entering the First World War was to have a profound effect on Wittgenstein's attitudes. It took a while. It took a while because he kept being posted to very safe parts of the, uh, 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 of the war. And he, because, because he was a Wittgenstein, the Austrian authorities said, look, we can't throw into the firing line the son of Karl Wittgenstein, will put him behind the lines where he'll be safe. But Wittgenstein kept applying to move because he wanted the experience of facing death. And they kept thinking he wanted to be moved even safer, so they kept moving him further, uh, 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 further from the front line. And eventually, he managed to get them to understood he wanted to be on the front line. And finally, he got to go uh, on the front line uh, at the Russian front, where God knows there was uh, plenty of facing death. But in the meantime, he had himself undergone a fairly profound kind of conversion experience. And what brought about that was he was in Poland, behind the lines, and he went into a bookshop, and the only book they had left was Leo Tolstoy's book, The Gospel in Brief, in which Leo Tolstoy retells the story of the Gospels. And Wittgenstein found this so moving, so powerful, he read it over and over again to the point where he, he, he was called by his fellow soldiers the man with the Gospels. And he knew this book practically off by heart. Then, while he was, while he was behind the lines, he carried on, that these manuscripts have survived, he carried on writing about the theory of logic that he was developing in Norway. And also, he wrote in these manuscripts personal remarks, personal remarks about how he was feeling, how he thought he was developing uh, ethically and spiritually and so on. 
But those remarks were cut off from the remarks on logic by being written in a code, a very simple code, where A equals Z and B equals Y and so on. Uh, he learnt this code uh, uh, with his sisters. And he wrote these personal remarks in, in, in code. But now, when he gets to the front in 1916, a remarkable thing happens in his manuscripts. He asks himself, what do I know about God and the meaning of life? And then he gives a list of things that he seems to know about God and the meaning of life. But what's remarkable is these remarks are not written in code. It's as if he's now thinking that's part of his philosophy. And he started to extend this distinction that he'd made with regard to logic, the distinction between saying and showing, he started to, do, to, to apply that to ethics, religion, aesthetics, and the question of the meaning of life. So with regard to all of those areas, important areas of human existence, he now came to think they all were ineffable. There were indeed truths, ethical truths, aesthetic truths, religious truths, but we can't say them. And so, it is indeed possible, according to Wittgenstein, to discover the meaning of life, but when you discover it, you will never be able to communicate it in language. Because, like the nature of logic, it, it is one of those things about which we cannot say anything. So when he wrote, when he finished his book, which he did do by the end of the war, it was a curious hybrid book. Roughly speaking, about five-sixths of the book is all about logic. And then the final sixth of the book expresses a kind of mysticism. And it's a sort of mysticism that, that, that is not unlike the various mystical religious traditions. The Chinese tradition of Taoism, for example, or Buddhism, or certain aspects of Hinduism, or the mystical tradition in uh, Judaism, or in Christianity. What a lot of those mystical traditions have in common is the thought that what is really important cannot be said. One has to, in the face of the really profound truths, maintain a silence. Well, this is the view that Wittgenstein adopted in the Tractatus, together with his theory of logic. And it's the combination of the two that makes that book so profoundly difficult to understand. There are people who, who, who technically can understand what he's saying about logic and the philosophy of mathematics, but who find the mysticism utterly incomprehensible. Bertrand Russell was one of those, and he wrote an introduction to the book uh, to, to, to get it published, in which he says just that, that he, you know, he, he, he finds the, the, the theory of logic fascinating and plausible, but finds the mysticism utterly uncongenial. And then there were other people to whom the mysticism expresses their own view of things, but to whom the theory of logic is incomprehensible. So this book took a lot of understanding, and it took a lot of persuading publishers um, to, to, to publish it. Russ Wittgenstein himself wrote a letter to a publisher urging him to publish it, in which he said one of the most helpful things about the book uh, he, said, he said to this publisher, Ludwig von Ficker was his name, he said to von Ficker, my book is really in two parts. He said, there's the part that I've written and the part that I haven't written. And he said, it's precisely the second part that's the most important. Well now, as an argument to persuade a publisher to publish a book, that's not very persuasive. You're asking the publisher to publish the wrong bit. But as an indication of how Wittgenstein saw his own work, I think it is terribly helpful. The, book, the famous last sentence of the work, book is, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Now Wittgenstein regarded this, he, Wittgenstein wasn't a modest man, and he regarded this book as having solved all the problems of philosophy. And so, in uh, consistency with that, he gave up philosophy. And he became an elementary school teacher. And he was a really bad elementary school teacher. Because he kept trying to teach his students. These were kids in you know, rural Austria, sons and daughters of farmers who didn't want their kids going to school anyway, uh, wanted them in the farm looking after the pigs and the horses and so on. And here was Wittgenstein trying to teach them advanced logic. <laughs> 
So he was a disaster as a school teacher. So we're now talking about the years after the First World War. He became a school teacher in 1922. Between 1922 and 27, he was a school teacher. During those years, the Tractatus, despite Wittgenstein's letter to the publisher, was published and was a huge hit with publishers, with, with philosophers, both in Cambridge and in Vienna. And in both Cambridge and Vienna, the same thing happened, which was philosophers of mathematics, of language and logic got very interested in Wittgenstein's theories and ignored all the mystical stuff. Well, now, when Wittgenstein uh, left school teaching, he'd been persuaded by a Cambridge philosopher, Frank Ramsey, who took all the trouble to go to, to, to Austria, meet with Wittgenstein, and persuaded Wittgenstein that he hadn't actually solved all the problems of philosophy. And so Wittgenstein was drawn back into philosophy and went back to Vienna. Now, there was a group of philosophers in Vienna who are now called the, the, the Vienna Circle, who were interested in logic and the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of mathematics. And they espoused a view that became known as verificationism, the view that the meaning of a sentence is given by how you would go about verifying it to be true or false. And they, they said, where you haven't got a process of verification, you haven't got a meaning. And they drew the conclusion from that that all religious statements, all traditional metaphysical statements, all statements about ethics and aesthetics were all meaningless. Now, of course, Wittgenstein also thought they were meaningless, but there was a very big difference between the two, which is... For the philosophers of the Vienna Circle, and uh, to give you some names, there's, there's, there's Moritz Schlick, uh, Otto Neurath, and, and Friedrich Weismann, Rudolf Carnap. For these philosophers, the statements of religion, metaphysics, ethics, and aesthetics were meaningless and to be thrown, as it were, in the waste paper basket. But for Wittgenstein, they were meaningless, but the truths they tried and failed to express were the most profound truths of all. So for Wittgenstein, there's a profound, as it were, silence. For the logical positivist, the Vienna Circle, there's no, there's no profundity there at all. Otto Neurath once summed up that uh, 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 difference by echoing the last sentence of the Tractatus, which is, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent. Otto Neurath said, one must indeed be silent, but not about anything. But for Wittgenstein, there was indeed something to be silent about. And that, I think, is a perfect illustration of what I began by saying, which is that with Wittgenstein more than almost any other philosopher, one has to understand not just what he's written, not just what he says, but what he hasn't said, what lies behind what he says. He himself was invited to join the discussions of the Vienna Circle, and they were discussing the finer points of logical theory, and they were shocked when Wittgenstein turned his back on them and started reading the mystical poems of the Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore, for whom Wittgenstein had a great admiration. And it was as if Wittgenstein was trying to say to, to these people, look, understanding logical form is one thing, but it's not the whole thing. Understanding those things which the poets and the musicians and the great artists try to evoke not through, not through declarative sentences, not through philosophical theories, but in other ways, in poems, in, 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 in pieces of music and in works of art. Wittgenstein was trying to say those are the most important things. All right, so in 1929, persuaded by Frank Ramsey, Wittgenstein returned to Cambridge, having uh, uh, now decided that there were flaws in what he'd said in Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. And in particular, he came to feel that the idea of logical form was no good. In the Tractatus, he had this idea, that language and our thoughts and the world all, sh all have something in common, which is logical form. The structure of our thoughts. What, what, how is it 
Wittgenstein asked, that we can think about the world. And the answer he gave to that was, we can structure our thoughts in a way that mirrors the structure of the world. And then we can put our thoughts into words because language has the same structure as thought, which has the same structure as the world. And the name that he gave to this structure was logical form. Well, Frank Ramsey pointed out various problems to that. And Wittgenstein's response to those problems was to completely abandon the idea of logical form. So from 1929 till his death in 1951, he worked on a new kind of philosophy, a philosophy that, like the older philosophy, is centered on understanding language, but now, unlike the early philosophy, doesn't try to do that with a theory of logical form. Rather, he says, there is no single form in our language. Rather, there's a series of differences, a series of a, a great multi multiplicity of ways in which we can use language. So in, in the Tractatus, he says, there are three ways we can utter a sentence. We can say that something is the case. We can assert something. We can make an assertion. We can ask whether something is the case, or we can command something to do this. So we can say, the door is open. We can ask, is the door open? Or we can say to somebody, shut the door. And according to Wittgenstein in the Tractatus, there are those three kinds of sentence. Now in the, his later work, which was published after his death as Philosophical Investigations, he says, how many different kinds of language are there? He says, okay, you've got assertion, question, command. And Wittgenstein says, no, there are countless kinds of language. He says, imagine what's involved in telling a joke. Imagine what's involved in telling a story, what's involved in a blueprint. There are myriad ways in which we can use language. And it's a mistake to assume that all of those ways will follow a single pattern, a single structure. Ra to understand language according to Wittgenstein's later work, we don't impose a single structure upon it. We look at the variations, the multiple ways in which we use language in our day-to-day -day existence. And he coined this expression a language game. The origin of that expression is this. He says, think of all the things that we call games. Some of those games involve a ball. Some of them are board games. Some of them are competitive games. Some of them are team games. Some of them are in individual games. What do they all have in common so that we call them all games? And Wittgenstein says nothing. There is not one single thing that they all have in common. Rather, there's a series of similarities and dissimilarities that cover the different kinds of things that we call game. And so Wittgenstein says it's a, it's a typical kind of philosopher's mistake to assume that there's a single essence applying to every concept that we use. You see this going on in the dialogues of Plato. The dialogues of Plato typically take the form of Socrates asking a question, what is knowledge? What is piety? What is truth? And then he'll ask the people that he's with and typically they'll give some examples of knowledge and truth or piety. And then Socrates in the dialogues will say, no, I don't want examples. I want the essence. I want to know what truth is. Okay, well, Wittgenstein's later philosophy could be understood as turning that platonic form on its head and stopping it at the point where Socrates says, no, I don't just want examples. I want the essence. Wittgenstein says, hold it right there. There is no essence. Examples is all you've got. You've got to see the connection." And that leads Wittgenstein onto a notion that's the inheritor of his earlier... He, he had earlier distinguished what one can say from what one has to show. Well, this idea of the things that one has to show, there's a sort of successor in the later philosophy to that, which is the idea of seeing connections, and the idea that an understanding can consist in seeing a connection. Wittgenstein use the example of family resemblances. So look at the people who belong to, to the same family. There's going to be a series of similarities and dissimilarities. 
Some of them are going to have the same nose. Some of them will have the same chin. Some of them will have the same way of waving their hands about. Um, but there won't be one thing that all of them have in common. There won't be, as it were, an essence of the family. And so he calls these family resemblances. And he says, you have to see the similarities. Now, let's, let's say you've got a mother and a daughter, and you see various ways in which the daughter looks like the mother. You see the similarity. You've got the mother here, you've got the daughter here, but the similarity is not some third thing that you're seeing, and yet in some non-metaphorical sense, you are seeing the similarity. Now, Wittgenstein says this is what... This is the kind of understanding we want in philosophy. And he, he contrasts it with a, a scientific understanding. And I'll just finish with, 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 with this. That what I regard as one of the most important parts of Wittgenstein's uh, uh, later philosophy is the opposition to what I would call scientism. Scientism is the view that if we don't have a scientific understanding of something, we have no understanding of it at all that the science and then everything else is confusion. And I think it's one of the most important parts of Wittgenstein's later philosophy to insist that that is not true. Just because poetry is not a science doesn't mean it can't convey understanding. Likewise with music, likewise with novel writing, and likewise with philosophy. And what's common to all of those forms, according to Wittgenstein, is that they convey an understanding not through developing a theory, but by offering you the understanding that consists in seeing connections. Okay, well, so with regard to Wittgenstein's life, um, he came back to Cambridge in, 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 in 29. He worked on this, these later ideas that he was never... He never put them in a form that he was happy with, and it never got published. His, his second work, his later work, was never published in his lifetime. He tried various ways of getting it uh, together and, and, and he couldn't. In the Second World War, he was based in England. Um, the, uh, his family were Jewish and uh, the, the, the family only escaped. His sisters were still in Vienna and after the Anschluss of 1938, they were therefore in, 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 uh, in Nazi Germany and in a very uh, dangerous position. They only escaped going to the death camps because the Wittgensteins handed over to the Nazis an enormous amount of money in return for which Wittgenstein's sisters were reclassified under the Nuremberg laws. They were no longer uh, full-blöthig uh, Jews. They were Mischlinger uh, of, of mixed race and therefore were not sent to the, to the camps. Wittgenstein himself stayed in, in, in England. He always had a dislike of formalities of any kind and particularly the formalities associated with universities, and he didn't regard his own work as a contribution to academic philosophy. That's the last thing he thought he was doing. And so he was constantly trying to leave academic life. He seriously thought at one stage of moving to the Soviet Union. Uh, he didn't do that, but he did give up. After the Second World War, he gave up his professor. He was made a professor at Cambridge, uh, which is the most unlikely appointment ever made. Uh, you know, imagine the University of Cambridge now appointing as professor of philosophy somebody who'd never read a word of Aristotle. Um, but he was made a professor. He gave that up, uh, uh, and he went to Ireland in the late 1940s. Um, he, 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 he was trying to recreate what he did in 1913 to 14 in Norway. Uh, in 1947, uh, he moved into the tiny cottage in, 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 in Ireland, trying to get his later work finished. Uh, I, I went to this remote part of Ireland when I was researching the book and I met the man um, whose job it was to visit Wittgenstein every morning. In that part of Ireland they use peat for everything. Peat is what you use to keep your house warm and so on. And uh, this man Tommy, Tommy Mulcairns, used to visit Wittgenstein every morning and, uh, and, and make sure he had enough peat and make sure he had enough food and so on. And he told me that every morning there would be some manuscripts that Wittgenstein, you know, Wittgenstein was writing his work and uh, he used to leave the manuscripts that he was dissatisfied with uh, for Tommy to, to, to get rid of and burn and so on. Now, these manuscripts would be worth a lot of money now. And um, I said to Tommy, well, weren't you ever tempted not to burn them but to keep them? And uh, Tommy said to me, no, they had writing all over them. They were no use at all. 
So uh, when he was living in Ireland, he contracted cancer, and Wittgenstein moved back to Cambridge, and he died in the home uh, of, his, of his doctor, Dr. Bevan. And his famous last words were, he got to know Dr. Bevan's wife, Joan Bevan, very well. And Joan Bevan uh, has remembered uh, that on the day he died, Vic Wittgenstein's friends were on their way to be with him when he died, but they didn't make it. And Wittgenstein's last words to Joan uh, were, tell them I've had a wonderful life. And that's what I tried to do in my book. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm happy to field some questions. Two questions? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Given um, Wittgenstein's um, obsession with seeing rather than saying, yeah. what did he say about the visual arts? What can he contribute to that? That's a really interesting question. Uh, and the answer is disappointing because um, he wasn't especially interested in the visual arts. That's, that's, that's a very interesting fact about Wittgenstein. Uh, music was the art that he knew a great deal of. And when you, see, when you look at his manuscripts, very often themes come to him. And he'll write, you know, he's writing about logic or mathematics or whatever it was, and he'll suddenly draw five lines and he'll, he'll write out a theme from Brahms or something. Uh, music was just in his mind constantly. Um, but, but the visual arts weren't. Um, he knew a certain amount about them, um, and he knew several important artists personally. He knew Gust Gustav Klimt. Klimt did the famous portrait of, of, of Wittgenstein's sister. Um, but there's remarkably little in his work about, or, or in his private uh, manuscripts, about visual arts. Whereas, there's a great deal about music, and he once said to his friend Morris Drury, how can I make myself understood when I can't say a word in my philosophy about all that music has meant to me? But it's very striking that it's music and not painting. Sculpture, now he did, he, did, um, he was very interested in sculpture. There's not very much uh, where he's reflecting about sculpture or, or writing about sculpture, but he himself made, made a, a head of a friend of his, uh, Margareta Respinger, and it's a rather beautiful, you know, beautifully austere, but it, uh, uh, technically rather good and, and aesthetically uh, uh, um, uh, pleasing in a sort of stripped down kind of way. I mean, his, he, he did have an aesthetics, and the aesthetics was the aesthetics of Adolf Lulz. He did, Wittgenstein designed a house where he's putting into effect some of, the, uh, uh, some of his concerns with the visual. And his, his house, like his sculpture, is completely unadorned. Uh, very stark. His sister described it as house-embodied logic, but it's rather beautiful in, a, in an austere kind of way. There's a question from here. Hi, so when you talked about the series of differences that he decided to pretty much use uh, in the later part of his life. Did that arise from his original uh, concerns with logic and the logical forms that he created, or was that something completely different from that? And uh, secondly, when you talk about the fact that he wanted to understand things as a series rather than as an essence, so is this something that complements the essence form of understanding, or is it something that transcends it? I'm not sure I understand your second question. Sorry, can you have another go at asking the second? I, I don't think I understand. Okay, uh, for example, let's take theorems, right? Theorems are a valid way of understanding certain things, yeah. right? So when he talks about series of differences and similarities, are these some things that just complement theorems in areas where they would not be completely applicable? Or are they something that transcend theorems and can give some sort of deeper understanding in areas where theorems are still applicable? Okay, I get it, yeah, right. So it's the second. Um, the whole point about the, the understanding that consists in seeing connections is that it's precisely not propositional. It's, it doesn't take the form of uttering prop propositions and therefore can't be expressed in a theorem because a theorem is a proposition. Now, with regard to your first bit, which ties in with your second bit, um, is this on, by the way? Can you hear, can you hear me? Um, so that your first part was 
when he talks about differences and fa uh, family resemblances and so on, uh, is, this, is this separate from his, in, his, his int interest in logic? No, it's not separate. It's, as, as you said, it's a, it's, a, it's a development from that. So it's, it's almost a consequence of him uh, rejecting his earlier notion of logical form. He had this, this all-enveloping idea of logical form. When he rejects that, the, um, the idea of, of uh, family resemblance concepts, which have no essence, that is what replaces uh, logical form. And, and part of that <coughs> is, like with the early distinction between saying and showing, there are things that one cannot say. So now, with, with the emphasis on the understanding that consists in seeing connections, there is therefore a kind of understanding that can't be put into a proposition, and therefore, a fortiori, can't be put into a theorem. Hello. I think with this, we come to the end of this thought-provoking and very impressive session by Raymond. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>